good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this. Uh, I, I suppose you could call it a course, but it's really a, a lecture on loosely entitled "How to Write a Paper." Now, because this is being uh, filmed, you cannot ask any questions until the end. So, because I, we just can't cope with um, a single camera looking at me and you asking questions. You can ask as many questions as you like, but it'll be at the end. Okay? I, I hope that the lecture won't take more than about 45 minutes, but there is a lot to get through. Okay, we'll begin. For those of you who've already published in the international literature, um, writing a scientific paper uh, as opposed to interpreting the data, writing the paper often seems straightforward. However, it's a skill. There's nothing clever about it. It's a skill. We're not born knowing how to do it. We have to learn. Most scientists start their careers by writing technical reports. And these are usually quite simple things like laboratory reports, field reports, site reports. And occasionally you move on to more sophisticated uh, interpretation of the data um, and perhaps providing solutions to specific ground problems. Factual reports provide a permanent record of measurements and observations, while interpretive reports give an explanation of, the why, of why the data are what they are. So, for example, a factual report might be a series of borehole logs uh, and in situ test results, and an interpretive report might explain why the in situ results vary and how that variation relates to some aspect of the geology, perhaps. But you should also remember that these reports can often be contractually constrained. This lecture is intended to help early career scientists and engineers who deal with ground-related problems um, whether as researchers or practitioners, uh, to publish their work and so help those that follow them to understand and anticipate what the ground is like. Published papers, particularly those in engineering, geology and geotechnical engineering, are usually one of three types. You can have a review paper which You've heard some of those uh, at this conference. They're quite often based, the written paper is quite often based on a keynote lecture. There are case histories, for example, about a specific engineering site. And then there are what I will call hypothesis-based research papers, usually but not always based on academic research. A review paper brings together the knowledge and information gained over many years on a particular, usually quite narrow, aspect of research. There may be few or no new results, but the paper gives the reader an overview um, of the subject. A case study usually looks at a particular problem encountered on a site and indicates how the problem was overcome and what lessons were learned. Sometimes uh, a case study will cover failures. Uh, these papers are particularly useful as they help us to understand mistakes that have been made so that we don't repeat them in the future. However, uh, obviously most of us are reluctant to publish um, our failures. Hypothesis-based research papers essentially provide the outcome of the testing of a specific scientific hypothesis. 
For example, the hypothesis might state that the ABC clay formation is more susceptible to mass movement than the XYZ clay formation. Factual data will be collected, summarized, and interpreted to either prove or disprove the hypothesis. So I hope that I am going to show you how a paper, whichever type, can be written. But I want to acknowledge, as is shown on the slide, that this lecture actually was prepared mostly by Nick Rengers, a former president of the International Association for Engineering Geology and the Environment. I've added to it, um, but the presentation remains essentially his. Basically, the presentation falls into three parts. Communication issues, because publishing is about communicating. How to write, you all think you can write. And the structure of scientific papers. There are no fixed rules, just recommendations based on best practice. And there will be some references at the end. You don't need to write any of this down because obviously this lecture will appear on the IAEG website in due course. The purpose of a scientific paper, as I've said, is to communicate, to communicate new knowledge. And the reason we do that is to enable other scientists, usually, um, to understand what we've done and to um, be able to take the knowledge we have generated, use it, apply it, modify it, add to it, and so on. Therefore, what we need to do is to present that research in, and I've highlighted it here, an unbiased, clear, coherent, and logically structured way. Because the reader has to understand what we've done, why we've done it, how we've done it, and what we concluded. And if we don't do it clearly, then we will have failed to communicate. But there are other reasons why we might want to um, communicate. And it really is summarized in the word impact. Because we as scientists, I should say you as scientists, have to sell your work. If you don't sell your work, you're not going to advance in your careers. Maybe. We have criteria for judging the impact of a research article. And that's the number of times it is cited in a year. The science citation index was developed to uh, make the information available to everyone. And it lists thousands and thousands of journals in which your paper may be uh, referred to. And in academia, managers will use this index to measure the impact of your research work. Now, I could give a lecture entirely on the uh, pluses and minuses of um, the Science Citation Index. But it is there, it is used, and it is a reason for uh, publishing your work. And obviously, research funding for those in academia um, tends to follow what you publish and what your 
particular uh, papers, how much they've been quoted by others. So the, um, for many, it's publish or perish. So there is a, a, a career driver to this. But do remember that communication of your work, publishing, is not restricted to others in your discipline. There are plenty of professionals and indeed occasionally uh, non-professionals who may be interested in what you've done and what conclusions you've come to. So, for example, civil and geotechnical engineers may be interested, urban planners, emergency services, and various other decision makers in local, regional, and national government. You're reaching out to a potentially very broad audience. And when disasters occur, as Jeff Keaton showed you earlier with the landslide in the American Northwest, the public too may be interested in what you do and what you say. Communication is not easy and you have to do it effectively. And the beginning, the start of the process of publishing your work is to ask yourself some questions. Who is my audience? Who is this for? Why am I writing it? What's the purpose of the paper? And what do I want to say? What is the message? If you can't answer those questions, then don't start. And these are some references from which this lecture was uh, created. But don't, as I say, don't write them down because they'll be on the website. How to write. Now, this is where the problems start. The standard approach is to define the content of your paper, to write an outline, to write a first draft, and then to revise and polish it. Sounds very simple. For most of us, for many of us, particularly when we haven't done it before or we've only done it occasionally or we've only contributed a small amount to somebody else's paper, it can be quite difficult. And there are other approaches which can help you to get over the, um, the, the difficulty of starting. So as I say, ask yourself the purpose and who it's for, and ask yourself how you are going to achieve the purpose. Because what you need to do is, is, is get in the groove of writing a paper. So sometimes just talking about it will help. Brainstorm if that helps. Talk at least with others, maybe friends, maybe colleagues whoever you feel comfortable with. Make lists of the things you want to talk about in your paper. Take a rest, because the greatest enemy of getting started is just trying to do it and you can't. So go away, do something else. Try to summarize your ideas of what you're trying to do into a few sentences. And then communicate, tell that to a friend or, some, or a colleague, somebody you trust, somebody you can be relaxed with. And make a, a little diagram of how you see the paper developing, the structure of it. And then have a rest, which probably, in my case, would be weeks. And then read the outline again and see if you still think that's 
what you want to do. And then you can begin to write the first draft. As you'll be aware, it's called writer's block. That's, that's what I'm discussing. But you, you don't have to get it right first time. You, it doesn't matter. Just write anything down. Get started. Just, it can be changed later. It can be screwed up and thrown in the bin. It doesn't matter. It's just making a start. And making a start does not mean starting at the beginning. Start in the middle. Often I find it's easier to write the section on what I did, what I mapped, what I measured, um, what I did in the laboratory, whatever. That part of the paper can be easier because you've done it. You're describing what you did and so do that. That'll get you going. And then again, have a go at describing what you want to do to a colleague or a friend. Get them to make notes or record what you say. Because often we can verbalize our ideas, but struggle to write them down. And that's what you're trying to get over. And don't feel constrained by time. Because we're all under pressure. We all have to deliver things to deadlines. But writing a paper when you've never done it before is not something to be over-constrained by time with. You've got to get there, and if it takes time, so be it. This is the rough structure of most papers. Um, the important bits are in uh, the, the larger lettering. Title and authorship and the abstract, keywords, and then the main part of the paper, the introduction, uh, the methods that you've used, the results, a discussion, uh, conclusions, and references. You may have uh, acknowledgments, and you will sometimes have appendices. I'll talk about those two later on. So, the title. The title is not just something that you bung down, you know, in an idle moment. and You, you have to think about it. Because the title is the first thing that people will see. Uh, if they're scanning through uh, lists of papers or whatever. And also the title identifies your topic. It should be short. Now I've said seven to ten words and you'll note uh, in a moment that one of the titles I've written is eleven. I'm just trying to give an indication that you don't want a title that is fifty words long. It should be accurate, it should be simple and uh, as I've said before it should be clear. And here's two examples. Uh, in its shorter version it, um, it, the first one is only four words long. Landslide occurrence in sets one. Or it could be study to determine landslide occurrence in sets one. Now, this is a real title, and I would say it should be um, five or eight words long because it should, should say sets one, China. The second one is a bit longer, 11 words. Correlations, okay, that's a word you can understand, we can all understand. You're going to correlate a few things. Between, it now tells us what, petrographic and geometrical properties of what? Ophiolitic aggregates from Greece. There's a lot of information in 11 words. That's a good title. And that's a real title as well. When I was uh, preparing the lecture, I reached up for a volume of the bulletin and I found that title. I could have also found some very bad titles that were 20 or 30 words long. So short is the, uh, uh, the key word. 
authorship. Um, obviously, all papers identify the authors, but there will be a format specified by the particular journal. Make sure you follow it. Um, it's irritating uh, for editors to receive papers with um, the wrong information on. If, if we ask for postal addresses, we mean postal addresses. So, usually you are expected to produce your given name, your family name, your postal address, and your email address. And you should do, do that for all authors. The abstract is also important because that's all that many people will ever read. They're usually in a hurry. Um, or that's all they may have access to. If they go onto a journal website, you can usually see the abstract, but you may have to pay to have the whole paper. So if you want to get them to read your whole paper, your abstract has to attract them. It's the paper in miniature. And so everything that's important must be in the abstract. You don't include uh, references in the abstract, um, nor do you need to include detailed reasoning. It's a short summary uh, of the paper, usually in less than 300 words. And it's always said, and I've always found it to be wise advice, that it should be written last. Because at the end of writing your paper, you will have a good idea uh, in your minds what your paper is actually about and therefore you will be able to write the abstract quite easily. Now I was sitting outside thinking about that, the abstract, um, when I realized that the papers that I submitted here, I'd written the abstract before I wrote the paper. So I'm contradicting myself. Well, no, because all you need to do in that circumstance is change the abstract when you submit the paper. You're not obliged to stick with the abstract that you first submitted. The components of the abstract are similar to the paper itself. Introduction, methodology, results and data, discussion and conclusions. Um, the Proportions are, like everything else, advisory, um, but they give you a guide so that you get a balance. Keywords. Now, usually the journal will advise you how many keywords. Um, usually not more than, well, five to seven. I, I, my experience you need to be at the lower end of that range. Think about your keywords, because once again, those are used by people to find papers they might be interested in. It's no good putting in an engineering journalological paper, one of your keywords is geology. I think most people will have worked that out, so it's a waste of a keyword. People doing literature reviews may use your keywords to find your paper that they might want to quote in their paper. So you need to um, think carefully about the keywords that you use. The introduction. Here are the things that you should be looking to include. Definition of the problem and description of its importance. If you don't tell people <laughs> what it is you know, that you're trying to uh, sort out um, right at the beginning, uh, they're going to be concerned to know as they read the paper. The purposes, objectives and setup of the research, they should be in the introduction. The summary of existing knowledge, the literature review and the questions to be answered by the research. I referred to um, papers, a type of paper, the hypothesis-based paper. 
And that basically sets a question which the paper will attempt to prove or disprove. And that hypothesis ought to be in the introduction. Um, for case histories, um, the description of the location and the site may well be in the beginning, in the introduction. The literature review. Now, sometimes people write literature reviews that are about half the paper. Um, and you are making, uh, as it says here, an inventory of existing knowledge. Because you need to relate your work to what has gone before, what has been done by other people. And you'll need to justify the way you've done it, the methods you've used by reference to what others have done in the past. But you should only include those references that are crucial to your work. That doesn't apply if you're writing a review paper because review papers are essentially extended literature reviews. So they will inevitably have considerably more reference to the literature than a research type paper. In the literature review, there are a number of uh, important questions that you need to be addressing. What is known about the subject area already? The main concepts and issues about the topic that you're writing about. Existing theories and debates there may have been. And where are inconsistencies or discrepancies in the work that's been done previously. And so identifying from all that the contribution that you can make, the gap in the literature. As I've said, don't try and read everything. Um, you do need to be selective. I know that research students tend to spend an inordinate amount of time reading an inordinate amount of literature, um, much of which is subsequently um, never looked at again. Well, that's part of research training, but a literature review in a published paper needs to be focused. And you can use a whole range of systems for identifying papers. And you obviously will end up using the abstracts and keywords in those other papers to identify whether you might want to read them further. When you do, I, it says there, avoid just reading but underline. Um, can I just say, um, I know a lot of librarians, and if they catch you underlining um, pages in a uh, published paper volume that they have in their library, they will not be very happy. Um, so when I say underline, I mean if you're using paper, make a photocopy and underline the photocopy. Of course, if you're using a digital version, you can underline. And make notes, because it's really, you will identify in reading the key things that you want to include. And, and this is really important, do not plagiarize. Please do not. You can end up being effectively banned for life as a researcher if you plagiarize. So what do you do when you want to say something that in your literature review that somebody else has already said? Well, there's two ways. You can either summarize it in your own words and then put the reference, or you can quote. In other words, you put it between, in English, in inverted commas, and again you put the, the reference. You're being honest if you, put, if you quote. You're, you're saying uh, these are the actual words used by the other author, and um, what she or he has said is so good that I don't want to summarize it. Here it is. 
don't quote paragraph after paragraph, just short key sentences, but mostly summarize it. And I'll say it again, don't plagiarize. If we editors catch you plagiarizing, you've had it. We will not publish you again. The methodology. We're now into the main body of the paper. You describe basically the approach you've used, the methods you've used, the procedures you've used, the equipment you've used, and any standards you've used when collecting your data. If you um, have used standard methods, there's no need to describe the method in great detail, uh, simply quote the standard and give the reference. But if you're using, if you developed a new method, then you do need to describe it in some detail because those that follow may want to use your method, they may want to check your method, they may want to apply it in another situation. So you have to give them enough information to be able uh, to carry out what you did. So broadly, the methodology um, covers the following. What you did to answer the scientific questions that you posed. What equipment and materials you used. What measurement methods you applied. And what calculations and other methods of analysis you used. So if you've used a, a piece of software, you need to say what you've used. You don't need to describe it, but you do need to refer to it. So people know that you've used whatever it is you've used. So we've introduced the topic, we've said what we're, going to do, what we're going to do, and we've started to say what we did do, and now we're going to present the results that we obtained. So you need to indicate what data you collected, where, when, how. You need to present the data so others can see it tables, figures. And if there's a lot of data, uh, you may need to put it in an appendix because you don't really want to fill the main body of the paper with endless tables. You need to say how you've analyzed the results and interpreted the results. And you need to indicate how those, the raw data and the results have been transformed into information so that the research question that you originally posed can be answered. And here's an example of, if you like, the raw data. Um, various um, measurements that have been made and this diagram shows where they were, where they were made. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of information on that diagram. They're the raw results. And then if you plot them up, plot of magnification factor against elevation for um, ground acceleration, that's the results. You're bringing the data together and you're producing some results which help you to prove or disprove your hypothesis. So, we've introduced the topic and said what we're doing. We've said how we made the measurements and gathered the data and we've presented all the data that we collected that's pertinent to the question we're trying to answer. So now we have the discussion. 
Here, as I've emphasized, we're closing the loop. We asked a question, a research question at the start, in the introduction. And now we're answering that question. We've shown what we did, and now we're showing how we've answered the question and presenting the answer that we obtained. So, you refer back to that question in the introduction. And you've got to discuss what the answer is and whether the question was solved. You might also discuss, discuss the reliability and the limitations of the results. And certainly you would want to discuss um, whether your results, how they fit with other people's results, similar work that others have done. If you've come up with something different, why is that? And you might include recommendations for more work in the future. Now, we all should do that. <laughs> because, you know, what are we doing? Whether we're working as uh, practitioners or um, researchers, um, we're probably looking for our next contract. In the discussion, you can feel a little more freed up. You can be... I've said less objective. I don't mean subjective, but I mean less objective. And to a degree, you can give opinions as long as you can justify them, and you can speculate a little bit. As I've said, you need to compare um, your results with published, published results by others uh, and point out the shortcomings. But what you do not do is introduce new results in the discussion. The discussion is a discussion about the results. It isn't a place to present results. So you do need, as the final bullet point up there says, you do need to um, compare your results with other people's your conclusions with other people's, so that people can understand why you differ from what they found. And the final main section of the paper is the conclusions. Now these days I find that I might read the introduction and I might then jump to the conclusions if I think the um, introduction is interesting um, because we live in a time constrained world so the conclusions should present the overall findings there are some they're not well I know I, I do you know the one word you must never use when describing a conclusions is summary. It's not a summary, okay? And I've just used the word. It's not a summary. It, and there, there's the bullet points, not a summary. It's statements that you can conclude from the work. It, you, you were asked your question at the start. You set out work to do to prove or disprove that statement. You've discussed it and come up with either a, 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 your hypothesis was right or wrong. And in the conclusions, you're bringing that out. And again, do not introduce anything new in the conclusions. If you do that, it's not a conclusion, but you'd be surprised how many papers do exactly that. So it, it's the bringing together the main points of what your work has been about and presenting it there in a succinct, um, short uh, explanation of the importance of what you've done, essentially. Acknowledgements. Um, usually people include these. Um, 
firstly to thank people who have helped them in their work um, and of course the people who provided the money uh, always wise to do that if you've had a research grant uh, probably as well to say who uh, provided the money or if it's a client has paid for the work probably a good idea to uh, to mention their name um, but it's not a place to thank um, your family and friends and all the rest of it I know you did that in your undergraduate dissertation in your MSc dissertation in your PhD thesis you thanked everybody well don't in a paper so I, I, I will don't worry I will uh, come on to the references in a moment but the main body of the paper there again are some figures that give you a broad guide to roughly what percentage each bit is um, and you can see that the two main sections are going to be the methodology and the results okay references references are a very important part of the paper because if you've referred to something people may want to check it and they need to be able to find it and many references are quite obscure so it is important that you present the information fully and accurately and I always know as an editor when you haven't read the reference it usually is indicated by the fact you don't quote it properly because somebody else quoted it and you're using their reference yes we know all the little tricks you get up to because we've done them all ourselves so why references well I mentioned about plagiarism that you're not allowed to do it uh, and references show um, that you are aware of the work of others um, as I say it allows readers to check the original sources and it provides some justification for some of the statements that you will have made and it safeguards you a little bit um, against mistakes made by the other authors if you've quoted them and it turns out they're wrong well you can't be blamed for that so what should you reference well quotations summaries paraphrases facts um, ideas anything that somebody else has written down that you're referring to should be referenced so the reference itself the three C's clear full details I'll come on to that consistent you should cite everything in the same way uh, one of the big bugbears of, uh, of um, um, providing uh, references is when there is no author do you use a non short for anonymous or do you do something else perhaps give the name of the organization that published the report it doesn't matter too much as long as you're consistent in your paper and they have to be correct and that means they have to be in the format required by the journal some examples this is for a journal paper author year of publication title journal title volume issue range of pages they are the easy ones and there's some examples look on the website when this comes out if you want to look at this slide again uh, papers from conferences this is where 90% of people get it wrong and I what can I say it drives me crackers if you're submitting to the bulletin do it properly author year of publication paper title and then the word in which tells you tells the reader it comes from somewhere else 
at a conference proceedings, say. Names of the editors. And if you haven't read the original reference, the source material, you won't know who the editors are. And that's how I know. So the names of the editors, the proceedings of, proceedings of the, whatever we are, 12th uh, Congress of the International Association for Engineering Geology and the Environment. I know it's long-winded and I know you can't be bothered, but you have to do it. Location of the conference, Torino. Volume number, there are eight volumes here. Page numbers, place of publication and the publisher. Publishers Springer, so the place of publication, I haven't looked, but it'll either be Berlin or Heidelberg. And there's an example of mine. Books, much simpler, author, year of publication, book title, place of publication, publisher. Website. I'm not going to go through this one as well, but you do need to indicate the website clearly and also put the date on which you accessed it because when I get round to looking at it, it may have gone, but at least I want reassurance that you, have, that you looked at it on a specific date. And of course, not all references are in the, the language of your paper. So you need to say, as, as it says here, if the paper is in another language. Although you quoted this paper in English, it was actually written in Chinese. And you need to say that so that people know. Now, sorry about this diagram. Um, it, it's not as neat as it should be. But I just wanted to address the issue of appendices. It's supplementary information, factual information, um, that is too much for the body of, main body of the paper. So the questions you need to ask yourself are, will the reader need to know this? And if the answer is no, then don't include it in the paper. But if the answer is yes, you have to then ask yourself, well, why do they really need to know? Do they need it to follow the argument? Well, if that's the answer, yes, then you should put it in the main body of the paper because what they don't want to be doing is flicking to the back of the paper and searching through three pages of tables to find the piece of, uh, of, of, of data or, or, or information um, that they need to understand the argument you've made. It should be in the main body of the paper. And if they don't need it to follow the argument, why have you got it in the paper in the first place? However, if it's referred to several times in the, in the main body of the paper, then it should be in the main body of the paper. But if not, it can go in the appendix. There's a bit of common sense about this, um, because there's a grey area, information that you feel needs to be included with the paper, but isn't really essential to the argument. It's supplementary information. And usually, uh, reviewers and the like will be helpful uh, if they feel you've overdone it. Well, I've almost finished, um, but not quite. These are the references for this paper, uh, this presentation, um, and again, they'll be on the website. But I've got two more slides, because I've taken you through the writing of a paper. You've now got the idea, and it's done, there it is. You've written it, hooray, it's all finished. No. You've got to do something else. You've got to check it. For completeness, for accuracy, for layout, spelling. And I do not mean with a spell checker, okay? It's easy for me, I know, because English is my native language. I know that makes it easier. But there's nothing more irritating than having something which has obviously been through a spell checker and the words are completely wrong. Okay? Grammar. And if 
the language of the paper is not your first language, then get somebody who has the language as their first language to read it, okay? And it may have to be another engineering geologist if it's highly technical, but get somebody to read it. And if you can't find somebody, then there are companies that will do it for you, but you have to pay. And please, I know if you're whatever nationality you are, it doesn't matter, but you've all got a friend who, let's say, speaks really, really, really good English as a second language. Don't ask them to do it. Because even though they speak excellent English, they don't speak perfect English. And I'm sorry, international journals require a paper to be perfect in the language in which it is published. It is very unfair on those of you who speak what, a language that is less common. But I'm afraid that's the way. Check the numbering of, for example, diagrams. Check the illustrations. Are they all there? Are they in the right order? Copyright. It's like plagiarism. If you, pub, if you uh, include a diagram or a photograph or whatever that isn't yours, you do need to get permission from the person who owns the copyright. It's a very boring task doing it, but you should. And check that the paper follows your original plan and that it answers the questions that you set out. And when you've done all that, and that will take some time and all that checking, read it again. And finally, if you want a final piece of advice, it's easy to remember, a nice little acronym, keep it short and simple. Short papers, concise papers are better than long papers. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope you've learnt a little bit. Do go on the website and um, enjoy the rest of the conference.